Okay. <coughs> uh, you know, the, in, in the, the events of the past week, uh, and actually, quite frankly, the events of the past several months and, and past few years have really pointed out <coughs> the divisions that exist uh, among us uh, here in the United States and throughout the world. That, you know, the divisions among us because of race, because of gender, because of sexual orientation, because of politics, because uh, there's nation against nation. We can go on and on and on. There's tremendous division throughout the world between uh, people. On Sunday, just because of the events that happened in the past week, uh, the pastor talked to us about a scripture that we actually affirm every week. Uh, and that, that one is, it, if, a, if, if I handle a matter wisely, I will find good. Now that scripture is in, is, it's actually Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20. And that, that complete verse that that comes from is this, Proverbs 16, 20. That, that full scripture is this, uh, he that handle a matter wisely will find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. That's from the King James Version. If you read that from the New Living Translation, it's those who listen to instruction will prosper. Those who trust the Lord will be joyful. Uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is one that I really like, says that at Proverbs 16, 20, says the one who understands the matter finds success and the one who trusts in the Lord will be happy. Now, all of these versions say it a little differently, but they're all saying the same thing. They're using different words, but what they say essentially is that uh, trust in the Lord and his word, and you'll find good no matter what the circumstances. You know, Pastor also talked to us about Sunday, on Sunday, on another scripture that he has, has given us many, many times, and that one is... Uh, that uh, we should agree with our adversary quickly. Uh, the, the, the scripture that, that he's, he takes that from is, is Matthew chapter 5, verse 25. And that's, that's part of Jesus' sermon on the mount, now, which was really Jesus' first big sermon. And he was really talking about uh, 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 introducing to, to the world the, the, a new way of relating to each other, the way God relates to us. And in that Sermon on the Mount, it says, uh, verse five, chapter 5, Matthew 5, verse 25, it says, The full scripture is, Agree with your adversary quickly while you are in the way, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, uh, and, and um, uh, essentially it says at the end of that, uh, once he hands you over to the officer, that you will be thrown in prison until you pay everything that you owe. Uh, so at Matthew 25, uh, 25 through 27. And what Jesus is talking about here really quite is that uh, he's talking about a civil matter. He's saying that if, if, you, if you have a civil dispute with someone, you owe someone or they owe you that before you go to court, you need to try to work this thing out. Because if you don't work it out, and it goes to court and you lose, then uh, you can be put into prison until that debt is paid. You know, we used to have debtors, something called debtors' prisons in this country uh, years ago. You, if you owed a debt and you couldn't pay it, then you were put in prison until that debt was paid. Now, that, 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 while he was talking about a civil matter here, it takes it, 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 the, the point is the same. Agree with the person that you disagree with quickly, and you can get it solved before it goes any further. Now, he was even, um, um, and so he said, and, and he also said, though, uh, later on, not only to agree with your adversary, uh, which we can define as an enemy, but he even said that we need to love our enemies. Not only agree with our adversary quickly, but really we are to love our enemies. So the point 
of, of agreeing with an enemy uh, before things get out of hand is important, but you also not only agree with them, but Jesus said that we are to love them. He said that also in that Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the exact verse of that is, is chapter 5, Matthew 5, verse 44. And that, that, that verse reads like this. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. Okay? He's even more direct than that in talking about loving our enemies. He's even more direct than that. You remember uh, when he was asked uh, by the Pharisee what's the greatest commandment is, uh, and he said uh, 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 to love God with all our heart, the soul, and our mind. That was the first and a great commandment. That's Matthew 22, uh, verse 37. Uh, but he said the next one, the next commandment, the second one, was like the first one. And that was, and the second is like this, you shall love the neighbor as yourself. Now, to make it plain, though, to make it plain, he went on to describe, using a parable, who that neighbor is that we are to love, right? Uh, and the parable that he used was one of the Good Samaritan. We know that parable, so we're not going to read it. But essentially, it, it was about this Jewish guy who got robbed and beat up. And it was laying on the side of the road in bad shape. A couple of his people that looked like him, a couple of Jews, and not only just Jewish people, but religious folk. A couple of religious folk came by, saw him laying on the side of the road, beat up, and they passed him on the other side. And we don't know what they said. We don't know if they said poor guy or because he was bloody and beat that they just decided, well, I need to go to, I need to, go to the other side of the road because I don't want to get close to him. We don't know what the reason was, but they went by. Then there came a Samaritan. Now, the, the thing that's really significant about this is that the Samaritans and Jews were mortal enemies. They hated each other. Now, it's a long story as to why they hated each other, and, and, and you need to probably study that. But there was a real hate between Samaritans and Jews, to the point that when Jesus uh, was in Samaria and he met a woman at a well who was a Samaritan, she was shocked that he would even talk with her. First of all, that she was a woman. And secondly, because she was a Samaritan. The hatred was so great that when a Jew went from Jerusalem, if they lived in Galilee, which was north of, of Jerusalem, uh, they, the, 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 uh, the most direct route home was to go through Samaria. Samaria. They would even take the long route around so that they would not have to go through Samaria, Samaria because they didn't want to run into any Samaritans. So they hated each other. Uh, but Jesus said that through this parable, this is the guy, your, the enemy, is the one who did, showed the kind of love that we should have for each other. So according to Jesus, now, we are to love everybody. We are to love our enemies. We are to, to, to agree with our Adversary, we're to love everybody. Okay, well, what does this have to do with solving the problems that we have here in this country? What does loving everybody have to do with getting along with, with black folks and white folks and yellow folks and red folks getting along, with straight people and gay people getting along, with the police and civilians getting along? What does this loving everybody have to do with that? Well, if we, if we love each other, then we can talk to each other. If we love each other, we can admit that we have problems. I can admit to you that I got a problem. Uh, I can admit to you that you hurt me. We can talk. If we love each other, we can agree to seek help 
to solve our problems. But if we're going to sustain the kind of love that allows us to do that, we got to have the kind of love that God has for mankind. Uh, we have to love like God loves us. First uh, John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, and we know this, this scripture, but I'm going to read it. First John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now that scripture says not only is, is love an attribute of God, but love is what God is. So God is love. Love is what God is, and, and, and that's the scripture that says that we should be love. We, we should be, if we love God, and we know that he is love, then we should be love. There's been a lot of talk this last week in particular about love. You know, everybody says love, we should love everybody. We're all God's children, and we should love each other. It's funny that we don't talk about loving everybody until something happens. Then everybody gets concerned about why don't we love? Why don't we love? Why don't we love? The emphasis uh, the past few months, uh, or, or this past week, for example, has been the love of white folk for black folk. White folks and black folk, you need to love each other. You need to, uh, gay folk and straight folk, you need to love each other. Uh, men, and women, you need to love each other, not, not, not be divided because of our gender. Uh, uh, we need to love our law enforcement officials. They need to love us. There have been, there have been, been speeches about love. There's been newspaper articles about love. There's been blogs written about love. It's love, 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 love. And that's a great thing. And if it happens... And we really start to love each other, there will be tremendous change, not only here in America, but throughout the world. But it's going to take more than just talking about it. It's going to take the kind of love that Jesus taught uh, about when he walked the earth. That's the kind of love it's going to take. It's going to take the kind of love that man God has for mankind uh, uh, to make the changes that's going to in these divisions, it's going to close these divisions. Yes, love is all we need, but that means that many of us are going to have to open ourselves up to what it really means to love like God's love. You know, God's love is unconditional. Uh, and yeah, you can say God's love is, is for, of salvation is conditioned on our accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's true. But the love that God has for us that allows that to happen is unconditional. God doesn't care who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. He loves you. There are no conditions on his love. Uh, the fact that, 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 that uh, we're alive and are human beings that all God needs, to know, needs for us to love us. Love us. That's the kind of love we need to have before we can begin to solve the problems between us. Now, the Greek word that's used for the kind of love that God has for mankind is uh, the one that's translated love in the Bible is agape. That's spelled A-G-A-P like Paul E. Agape is not the natural kind of love that we have for a spouse or relative, or friend, it's the kind of love that God shows for mankind. The kind of love that we don't deserve. The kind of love that we don't earn. That's the kind of love. That's what agape is. That's the kind of love that caused God to give his son for our salvation and to give us eternal life when we, here's the key, the kind of love that he had for us when we were his enemies. God loves us conditionally when we were his enemies. If you go to Romans chapter 5, 
And uh, we're going to start at verse 8. Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10 says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Agape is a kind of love that Jesus showed when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Uh, the scripture that we just read uh, says that it was through, his, through the death of God's son that we can be reconciled. So God, Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life for us while we were enemies of his father and him. That real love and the kind of love that we should have for each other and by extension for our enemies. The kind of love that Jesus says we need to have for our enemies is the same kind of love that God has for us. As a matter of fact, Jesus commands us, his disciples, right, to love. Uh, John 15 uh, verses 12 and 13. It's John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. Is this. This is Jesus talking. This is my commandment that if you love one another as I have loved you, I mean, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. So, Jesus said, no greater love does anybody have than, than, than somebody to lay down his life for his friends. Now, it doesn't, that's not saying necessarily that we have to do that, but we may have to. Uh, but it's that kind of love that Jesus is talking about. And the kind of love that if we have for one another and for our enemies, we can start the ball rolling. Uh, so... Uh, so what kind of what does that kind of love look like? I'm we talking about that's 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 some tough stuff. What kind of love does what does that kind of love we're talking about really look like? Okay, well we all know the description that Paul uh, gave us of agape. Uh, that's in First Corinthians chapter thirteen. So if you want to take a second, let's go there. First Corinthians chapter thirteen, and I'm going to. To, to really emphasize uh, a few verses as we talk about what that kind of love looks like, the kind of love that can change the world. Uh, let's, let's start at verse 4, and we're going to read right now verses 4 through uh, 8. Love suffers long in its kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And in verse 8 it says, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail, whether there are tongues, they will cease, whether there's knowledge, it will vanish away. Now, uh, the psychiatrist R.D. Lang, and I don't know who he is, but I saw, I saw this quote and it, 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 it hit me hard. The psychiatrist R.D. Lang says that we are effectively destroying ourselves by violence masquerading as love. We are effectively destroying ourselves by violence masquerading as love. You know, love is perhaps the most abused, uh, the most, perhaps the most abused phrase, rather, in the English language, maybe I love you. 
That may be the most abused phrase in the English language. Instead of communicating unselfish caring, it often expresses enlightened self-interest, manipulative uh, attention, or sheer lust. Okay? <laughs> not the care, not unselfish caring. The description of love that I just read uh, that was uh, from Paul was a part of a letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth. So he was writing to Christians. He wasn't writing to unbelievers. Uh, that church had problems. There were those in that church who thought they were more important than others. There were those who were siding with one leader versus another leader. There were wealthy people who were taking advantage of poor folk. Uh, the church was divided on many, many issues. Looks kind of like this society, doesn't it? Uh, so if we look at the first, look at, look at uh, uh, verses 4 through 7, what we'll find is that uh, uh, those examples of people with love, with that example of things people don't do, uh, who have this agape kind of love. Paul not only defines it for us, uh, in the end, he shows us what's the best way to live, to relate to everybody. Uh, if we go back to the verse 4, the first part of verse 4, verse 4 tells us what love is like. Uh, it's patient and kind, Right? That's the same kind of attitude that God has toward us. He's patient and he's kind. Um, Romans chapter 2 verse 4 uh, says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So it says here that God's patient with us, and that patience leads to repentance. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says this, that God, the Lord, is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but long-suffering patience toward us, not willing that any should perish, that should all, but that all should come to repentance. So agape okay, is patient and kind. That's the way we should be with each other. And with our enemies. Uh, being patient, we, you can make your point. You can state your case. But then give God a chance to work on your enemy or on you to cause you to see things differently. Let's do what the scriptures tell us to do. If we do what the scriptures tell us to do, then we'll be handling a matter wisely. Now, the rest of verse 4 uh, through verse 7 tells us what people with agape, the God kind of love, do not do. Okay? The second, second part of verse 4 through verse 7 tells us what agape, people with that kind of love, do not do. So I'll read that again. Starting with this, the second half of verse 4. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. People with agape, I'm going to start using the word agape for the rest of this rather than love, so you know what I'm talking about. People with agape don't envy others. They're not jealous. Uh, the kind of jealousy that I'm talking about is a destructive kind of jealous. Uh, the kind of jealous uh, that's what, where you're suspicious of somebody or their achievement or any advantages that they have. Agape doesn't envy those people. People with agape are not boastful. Uh, you know, people boast so that to make other people notice them. That's why people boast. People boast to make you, you know, I boast to you to make you notice me. 
I'm to lift myself up. It's not possible for me to be boastful and to love you at the same time. Because if I'm boasting, I'm wanting you to notice me. So that's not possible for me to want you to notice me and for me to love you at the same time. You remember uh, Jesus talking about a Pharisee uh, that, was, that was boastful. If you go to Luke real quick, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. This is, kind, this is the thing that a person with agape doesn't do. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to read. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised us others. That's being boastful. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself boasts, it will be humbled. God will humble them. And he who humbles himself will be exhausted. So a, a person with agape is not boastful. Remember, that person it does, is an envious, and that person is not boastful. People with agape are not puffed up or proud. A proud person thinks too much about their own importance. You know, a person with agape is humble, not elevating your own importance. All right? Being humble is not elevating your own importance. It doesn't mean you're weak. You're just not elevating your importance. Uh, Romans, uh, there's a couple of scriptures I want, you, want to show you there. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Um, says, for I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. The point here is that you are saved through God's grace, not because of your importance or anything you did or because of, of, of who you are. It was by God's grace. So don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to because uh, you didn't earn anything that God did for you. Okay, uh, So uh, why puff yourself up? So a person with agape is not proud or puffed up. Galatians chapter 6 verse 4 says this, but let everyone examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself and not in another. Again, don't consider yourself more important than you are. Don't overevaluate yourself. You know, put your own work to the test. Okay? And if you find it's good, uh, if there's anything there to give satisfaction, then you can rejoice in that. But the rejoicing is in, the con is in contentment, not pride or superiority over someone else. Rejoice because you accomplished something, but not, at the, not, not uh, prideful or superior over somebody else. Um, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34 says, Surely he, sco he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. As the scripture says that pride becomes before a fall, comes before a fall. So remember, uh, people with agape are not puffed up and they're not proud. So what I'm talking about, what I'm going to talk about is the kind of love that's going to make a difference. 
People with agape don't behave rudely or badly or inappropriately. Uh, and that means just more, that means more than just being polite. What that means is to think about others above yourself. Think about others above yourself. They are more important to you than you are to you. That's, a, that's agape. That's, and, and, if, and, and, and someone without that uh, would seek themselves first. People with agape don't seek their own first. They don't look out for their own interests before considering others. All right? People with agape, the God kind of love, don't do that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24 says, Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. That's agape. People with agape are not easily provoked. They don't, easily, they don't become angry easily. Um, you know, Paul started in verse 4, it says, Love is patient and kind. All right. Uh, then... Um, uh, not becoming angry shows patience. One kind of patience is the ability to stay calm when other people are angry. Agape doesn't answer insults with anger. It's okay to become angry at times, uh, but love is patient even in anger. Paul suggests <laughs> uh, uh, to be angry and do not sin. Do not, he suggests, we don't let the sun go down on our anger. Uh, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, if you want to know what those verses are. Uh, uh, Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So there is such a thing as righteous anger. Right. Although now let's be careful. Righteous anger can be abused. That term can be abused. That's like saying when we when we say to somebody, we see something that they're doing or that irritates us. And we say, I'm telling you this in love. Right. That's that's exhibiting righteous uh, uh, anger. Uh, but we're abusing that when, because we're not doing it in love either. So let's be careful about. Um, uh, the term, using the term righteous anger. There is such a thing, but let's be careful about it. Paul is saying uh, that, that if you are angry, be sure it's the kind of anger that's not sinful. And it's a kind of, and, and, and exhibit some patience when the, in that anger. People with agape don't take pleasure in evil things. They don't rejoice in iniquity. Um, it's a, you know what's sad today is that uh, <clears throat> especially on the news or when we hear some gossip people like to hear about the failures of other people uh, people with agape don't delight in that kind of thing uh, you know newspapers and television uh, often, often encourage an interest in other people's sins and we rejoice in that a loving person, a loving Christian, doesn't try to find fault in other people. What we look for is the good in other people. That's what agape is. People with agape don't keep a record of how, of how what people have done to them or how people have hurt them. Uh, just think about it. God in Christ doesn't keep a record of our sins. Once we're saved. So if we have agape, we shouldn't remember or keep on our, in our remembrance an action or an insult against us. You know, some people say, uh, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. Well, that statement means when you say it like that, with that kind of attitude, uh, it means you haven't really forgotten. Now, uh, that really doesn't mean you never forget because you can never really forget. Uh, but what it means is you, you will not act on, 
you would, uh, what, what happened would, will not affect your relationship with them. Doesn't mean you got to relate to them, but won't, you won't do anything that as a result of what they did to you. Uh, I don't have time to go into that tonight, uh, but maybe another Bible study, uh, we can talk about how you can forgive, really forgive, and because that's what is required of us. God forgave us, and it's required that we should really forgive but as human beings, we always have in our mind what it was. There's a way to deal with that. And we can talk about that maybe in a, in a, in a Bible study or so. Or I've written a couple of articles, or blog articles, if you're interested about that. But, but that's something we can talk about later. Um, now, uh, after talking about the things that people with agape don't do, and that was a list we just went over. People with agape, uh, let me go back over. People with agape, uh, I gotta find it now. <laughs> People with agape don't envy, they're not jealous, they're not boastful, uh, they're not puffed up or proud. Uh, People with agape don't behave rudely or act inappropriately. People with agape don't seek their own first. People with agape don't become easily angry or let the anger dictate the way they act. Uh, people with agape don't take pleasure in iniquity, seeing someone else's iniquity so we can point at it. Um, uh, people with agape don't keep record. People with agape forgive. But Paul ends this, ends that litany of People, what people with a God kind of love don't do, uh, and it, by, by saying what it doesn't do, then the inference is you know what it does do, right? Okay? Uh, after saying that, all of this about love and describing what it is, he said, it never changes. It's permanent. That kind of love is permanent. If we start at verse 8 of chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If we start at verse 8. 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. We just went over the first seven verses, or 4 through 7. Verse 8 it says, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there's knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now, now I know in part, then I shall know just as I am, am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, there, 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 are, there are three things that Paul talks about being very important in a believer's life. Uh, uh, and people in general, the three things are important. That there are faith, their hope, and their love. Faith, uh, faith that God will forgive us because of Jesus' sacrifice. And then hope for the future because of Jesus' sacrifice. Because when he returns, when Jesus returns, uh, there'll be no more reason for faith, okay? And there's no more reason for hope. Because the faith that we have for salvation and the hope uh, that we have because of Jesus' resurrection, those things are accomplished when he comes back, Right? Uh, so there's no longer any need for faith. There's no longer any need for hope. But the thing that's permanent, that, that lasts forever, is love because God himself is love, right? And he will be with us for eternity, the eternity that lasts. So love is permanent because God is permanent and God is love. Okay, we talked about a lot of stuff tonight. That's, that's great. 
<laughs> All this agape stuff sounds wonderful. And if everybody had that kind of love, we would not have any problems in this world. However, <laughs> we do. Okay? Uh, and the, the, because of the presence of sin, the uh, prevents us all from having the God kind of love. Uh, first of all, you know, sin is really rebellion. It's really rebellion against the authority of God as the creator. You know, he, gave, he told Adam and Eve, one thing, there's just one thing you can't do, <laughs> and that's to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they disobeyed. They rebelled, and they disobeyed. And because of that, sin now entered the creation. And since we've all inherited that nature, it has become impossible for sinful man to achieve the kind of love that God has for us and that Jesus actually commanded that we have for each other. He said we, not only we got to love our Christian brothers and sisters, but we got to love our enemies. That's what he said. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he said uh, in John thirteen thirty five, he said, By this you will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But he also said that we got to love our enemies. So that's what God commands us to do. He commands us to love him and to love our neighbor, which includes our enemies. Well, if God commands us to do something, okay, uh, that we can't accomplish because of our human limitations, that's not, that doesn't mean it can't happen. Uh, what is impossible for us to do it's possible for us to do through God. Uh, uh, it's possible for those of us who's given our lives uh, to Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit to do what God commands us to do. Here's what Jesus said um, about, about, a, about the impossibility of man to enter of the kingdom of heaven. He has told his disciples, here's how you get in. And they say, that's impossible. Well, here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 through 26. Here's what he said. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that, is, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So we've seen now that uh, uh, glimpses of the kind of, kind of love that God was talking about in the past few months. And we always see it in the aftermath of tragedies, whether it's a natural disaster or something like's happened with the murders uh, from, from terrorist activities. We've seen glimpses of people loving each other, police officers risking their lives, for, for people that don't look like them, for people of, of, of different races. Uh, uh, it, for, for, for civilians seeing uh, officers hurt running to help them. Uh, it's for, it's, it's when, when, when there's a natural disaster, we send clothing, we send money, we show all this kind of love. Uh, we could go on and on and on. So we see that it can happen if we do what Jesus <coughs> taught us to do. Uh, however, we cannot do it in ourselves. We must do it through the power of the Holy Spirit who's in us. We're commanded to love. We're commanded to love our enemies. We're commanded to love each other. Uh, it, 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 you know, what matters to God is our love for him and our love for each other. That's what matters to God. Wealth, power, 
status doesn't account for anything in the kingdom of God. When we truly love each other, when we truly love our enemies, we do our part to make the world a better place. But we must depend on the Holy Spirit. And for us who are believers, it's incumbent upon us to show the God kind of love as an example to the world. I've seen some articles written since, since Dallas uh, where, where the church is condemned for not doing what we need to do. And, 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 and I, I agree with some of that in that if we truly, if we truly exhibited the kind of love that God has for us, then, then our lives would be examples for those, of, for those in the world that are doing the kinds of things that cause hurt and harm, that are doing the kinds of things that they say we need to love each other to do, but once, once, the, once a few weeks pass or a month pass and we've forgotten about all this stuff and we go back into the way, normal way we are, we no longer exhibit the kind of love that God has for us. So this time is an opportunity for us to let our lights shine. We have an opportunity now to show the kind of love that God has for us. It doesn't mean being taken advantage of. It doesn't mean not speaking our opinion. It doesn't mean uh, pointing out when somebody else is wrong. It doesn't mean those things. What it means, though, is it to do those kinds of things in the love that God has for us. God, told, God, God tells us when we do stuff that, that disappoints him. He tells us when we do stuff wrong, but he does it with the same kind of love that we're able to exhibit if we allow the Holy Spirit to operate through us. We are able, if we allow the Holy Spirit, if we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us, completely and be used completely by him, we are able to exhibit the kind of love that God has for us, for others, even our enemies. So this is an opportunity for us to let our light shine. It's an opportunity to take our lights out from underneath the bushel. It's, it's an opportunity for us to be that lighthouse on the hill. Uh, if we do that, we will, the church, will be able to, to, to address and be leaders in addressing the issues and the divisions between us. Let's let the Holy Spirit work through us to cause these things to happen. Yes, it's just, just a few of us, there's one or two of us, but the numbers will multiply if we show the kind of love that God has for us. So let's, let's tonight, let's tonight say we're going to start doing that. I'm going to start doing it. I don't do it all the time. <laughs> I'm going to start doing it because now is an opportunity, you know, rather than this being punishment because, because the nation, uh, we, because we took uh, prayer out of the schools, and that's a problem, because we don't want to talk about Jesus in public forums, that's a problem. And that's something. And 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 some people say what's going on is punishment for that. I don't happen to agree with that. But 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 let's say these kinds of things now are an opportunity for us to show the kind of love that God has for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time tonight. Thank you for those that were here uh, tonight in the sanctuary and on the prayer line. Thank you, Lord God, that we're able to see from your word that love is really the answer to all things. Love is really the answer to the problems that we see in, in this world, the problems that we have between each other, the problems that sin has. Uh, the problems of sin. I say that, Father, because it's your love for us that caused you to send your son Jesus to die for us. Love is really all we need if we open ourselves up and allow the love that you have for us 
to flow through us uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit to others. We thank you, Father, for this time. We covenant tonight uh, with you that we are going to let agape flow from us to the world. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we